to date, and the nation basked in peace, wealth, and spiritual awareness. But as soon as Solomon died in 797 BCE, the kingdom was split in two, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The dynasty of King David flourished in Judah, but ruled over just two tribes. The remaining 10 tribes in the northern kingdom produced their own chaotic assortment of monarchs. Their kings encouraged idolatry and were often terrible and tyrannical. God sent a steady stream of prophets to rebuke the monarchs and their respective subjects. Ahab was the infamous seventh king of the northern kingdom. He reigned in the mid-800s BCE for 22 years. Ahab was evil and despotic, but his powerful pagan wife outdid him in her depravity. Queen Jezebel was a Phoenician, and she built temples of idolatry and executed almost every prophet of God. Jezebel was bent on converting the Jews into a nation of Baal worshippers. She almost succeeded, but a fearless prophet named Elijah stepped onto the scene. One of Jewish history's most legendary prophets, his major showdown with Ahab and Jezebel came on the heels of an ancient curse. Four centuries earlier, back in 1273 BCE, Joshua led the Jews in conquest of the Holy Land. His first act of conquest was against the city of Jericho, which fell in an astoundingly miraculous manner. Joshua then uttered a dramatic curse. The man that arises and rebuilds this city Jericho shall be cursed before God. With the loss of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. Until Ahab's times, Jericho lay in ruins. But Ahab's good friend, Hiel of Bethel, dared to rebuild Jericho. Israel followed in horror as Hiel lost one child after another in the process. The Talmud relates that the evil king Ahab visited Hiel to comfort him. There he met Elijah. Ahab mocked Elijah. Do you associate Hiel's tragedy with Joshua's curse? Nonsense. Moses was greater than Joshua, and even his curse went unfulfilled. Did Moses not warn that if we serve idols, God will withhold the reins? But I erected idols on every hilltop, and look, it's hard to stand outdoors worshipping idols with all these rain showers. Elijah responded to the monarch's public blasphemy by proclaiming the start of a years-long drought throughout the idolatrous kingdom. It is to the sound of an apparent nation gasping for water that we begin today's lesson. Okay, so um, that was just a short um, um, synopsis of one part of Elijah's right. life. And um, it gives in context, uh, because the truth is, um, the first part of, um, we don't hear, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. We don't hear of Elijah at all. Um, in fact, uh, Elijah's whole timeline story um, is in the context of the reign of uh, the king Ahab, the, the Ahab and Yosefet, um, with the exception of two, two, two chapters. It runs from chapter 17 of Malachim Aleph of Kings 1 through to the second chapter of Kings 2. And the, the, the Torah doesn't, the, the Book of Prophets doesn't give us any background who this Elijah was. It just briefly says, um, it just characterizes him as Tishbi, the, uh, the, the prophet from Tish, uh, Tishbi. And the first time we ever introduced to him in scriptures is when he comes to rebuke um, delivering Hashem's word to this evil king Ahab and warning him that um, if he continues in his way, that there will be ca uh, catastrophic drought, um, etc. After his confrontation with Ahab, Hashem tells him to flee the land of Israel, and eventually he makes it to the home uh, of, a of a widow in the town of Zarephath in 
poem uh, Nietzsche, where we, where we read a famous story of him uh, reviving the, the, this lady's dead son. And in fact, that's the first time in scripture, in, in Tanakh, that we read of the, a miracle of resurrection. Afterwards, after three years of drought and famine, Hashem tells Eliyahu to return to Ahav and announce that it's going to be the end of the drought. And after a verbal altercation between Ahav, Eliyahu finally challenges, because remember, that whole kingdom was... was um, um, was plagued with this pandemic of, of, of having idol worship and they were serving uh, what's called the Baal. And so he finally decided he's going to have a show a showdown and um, to prove who the real God is and the false God of the Baal. And in fact, Eliyahu proposes that they do a direct test. It's quite detailed in Tanakh, and, but in brief, Two Mizbeachs were set up, two altars were set up, one for Hashem himself and one for the Baal. And the prophets of the Baal, um, obviously fut uh, uh, in futile, tried to elicit God to accept their, their sacrifices, whereas uh, obviously Eliyahu was... Are uh, you breaking up here? I don't know. Obviously, can you hear me? Where obviously Eliyahu was successful in, um, in bringing his... Uh, in bringing Hashem's uh, sacrifices. After that victory, Eliyahu orders the death of the, these priests of Baal, and Eliyahu then davens and prays for there to be rain again, and rain begins and ends the famine. Then Ahab's wife, the king, Isabel, or Isabel, enraged that Eliyahu was furious that Eliyahu uh, uh, killed, ordered the death of the priest. So she threatens Eliyahu, and so Eliyahu flees. He, he flees, and eventually he makes it to the Mount Choreb, Choreb, where Hashem appears to Eliyahu, and he says, what are you doing here? And unlike Moshe, who tried to defend the Jewish people when they sinned with the gold, golden calf, Eliyahu bitterly complained to Hashem about the unfaithfulness of the Israelites. And he says, am I the only one left? And after a series of visions over there, Hashem sends him out to Dam um, Damascus to appoint Chazel as the king of Aram and Yehu as king of Israel and Elisha as his replacement of the prophet. Obviously, there's other details in his life, but that's a brief outline of Eliyahu's life. Now, I'm getting messages over here. Can everyone hear me? Good. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Now, perhaps one of the most famous uh, chapters in the life of Eliyahu is actually surrounds his death, or perhaps the lack of it, because um, we're going to see now in this text the scriptures doesn't, don't, doesn't actually show that he physically died. And the, the story goes that Eliyahu, who was with his uh, tutor, a student, Elisha, who was going to replace him, um, and Elisha never wanted to leave him go. He's, because Elisha said that if you go to the next world, you can't leave us without a, a Nasi, I'm going to go with you. And he wouldn't let him go until eventually he goes. To, they both, and uh, Eliyahu says, where I go, you can't go. And Elisha said, I'm, go I'm going with you. And until eventually they come to the, uh, to the waters uh, that, by the Jordan. And 
uh, Eliyahu strikes the waters and it immediately divides and Eliyahu and Elisha cross on dry land and suddenly a fire, this imagery of a fire and horses appear as the, as the Tanakh say, says, and Eliyahu is lifted up into a whirlwind. But before he leaves, he gives Elisha um, one last request. And Elisha, we will see now, asks that he uh, give him, uh, that he should be double um, the powers of Eliyahu should be given to him. And as Eliyahu is lifted up, uh, Elisha picks, picks it up. Okay, now let's look at it, the text itself. All right. Mark, you want to read it? And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water and it divided to the side and to that side. And they both crossed on dry land. And it was when they crossed that Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I should do for you while I am not yet taken away from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have made a difficult request. If you see me taken from you, it will be so to you. And if not, it will be not. And it was that they were going, walking and talking and behold, a fiery chariot and fiery horses. And they separated them both. And Elijah ascended to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw, and he was crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the riders. And he saw him no longer. Now he took hold of his garments and rent them in two pieces. Okay. So basically, uh, that is, in a nutshell, the brief background of what we have from scriptures of Eliyahu's story, Elijah's stories. Now, that's the background. What about, um, so... Well, the real background is this connection to Chaz, I'm assuming. That's the background. That's, a, that's the story. Question is now, who is the Elijah of today? That's what we know from Tanakh. Now let's talk about Elijah of today. So, because we know that the story doesn't end there. Because in Jewish life, Eliyahu pops up all over. Elijah pops up all over. And uh, we're going um, we, uh, to explore those, the, those, those. And then we will pivot into the discussion of where uh, his role of, uh, with Mashiach comes. So an important detail in the background to Eliyahu's story, which I mentioned before, which is very much missing, is who exactly was he? Who exactly is Eliyahu? Where did he come from? Who are his parents? Uh, what was, and what was he doing all those years before he just, um, uh, he just burst into the picture of him um, coming into the king's palace and admonishing him? I mean, who was this guy? We don't know. It, it doesn't tell us. The scriptures don't say anything about his background. So the, outside of scripture, there are different accounts of where he comes from. One midrash, um, uh, which is the statement of our sages, argue that the, 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 uh, there's an argument between two sages of what tribe. You know, we know that the Jewish people are divided into 12 tribes. Which tribe did Eliyahu come from? So one sage says he came from the tribe of Gad, and the other argued that he came from the tribe of Benjamin, of Benjamin. And the Midrash concludes, interestingly enough, that Eliyahu himself appeared to these sages and testified that he was from the children of Rachel, of Rachel, which would then obviously place him in which tribe? Benjamin. Very good. In the tribe of Benjamin. Another Midrash attributes Eliyahu to the tribe of Benjamin after relating a very interesting story of, um, debate, of the debating, sa debating sages had with Eliyahu himself. And there is also 
In addition to that, a very popular tradition that Eliyahu is in fact the same person as Pinchas. What, what's Pinchas in English? I don't know. I don't know. Don't know. <laughs> huh? Don't know. Well, Pinchas, the, st the famous story of Pinchas mm -hmm. in the Torah that, uh, z uh, that zealously killed, which I'll explain soon, Zimri, who was the prince of, Shim uh, of Shimon. And um, in that act of zealousness, um, the, it binds those two characters, uh, characters together. And in, that, in the sages, they ultimately point them, as we're going to see soon in the Midrash, as being the same person. So it's not from Benjamin. Which would, if Pinchas is uh, very good, if Pinchas is from, if Pinchas is Eliyahu, Pinchas is from which tribe? Levi. Levi, very good, because he was one of the grandchildren of Aaron, and Aaron is, came from the tribe of Levi. Right. Now this, this plays out, by the way, of where exactly Pinchas is from and who exactly was Pinchas throughout uh, the sages, uh, uh, through the Tanoim, even down to the commentaries of Rashi, like the Rishonim. And, um, and in fact, just an interesting discussion. This is uh, out, not uh, just out of con and not, not relevant to the class itself, but just um, uh, FYI, there's an interesting discussion that actually comes out from that, that if Eliyahu was Pincha, is Pinchas, and they're the same person, then w the story, the famous story where Eliyahu comes and revives the son of that widow that uh, gave him some, so much hospitality. Um, if he was Pinchas, we know, what was Pinchas rewarded with for killing Zimri? Oh God. He became a Kohen. Oh uh, yeah. And a Kohen, even though he was born into the Kohen's tribes, he was the grandson of Aaron, uh, but uh, anyone that was born prior to Aaron becoming the Kohen uh, was not a Kohen. Only those that once Aaron was appointed the high priest, anyone that was born after that point automatically became a Kohen. Now, being that Pinchas was born prior to that, he was okay. not a Kohen. But in, uh, as a reward for what he had done, in honor of God for, for, for slaying Zimri, which we'll go through that story shortly, he got awarded um, the stature of becoming a Kohen. Now, if Eliyahu is Pinchas, we know that a Kohen was not allowed to go, um, was not allowed to become, um, have any, um, um, have any, um, the dealing with dead bodies we weren't allowed to touch them they, they, because um, any uh, to deal with a dead body you become impure and the coin is not allowed to become impure except for a few cases so the question the, in that um, the sages asked is that how did Eliyahu permit even to go to the dead body center of other so there's a few answers in there. Um, some say because it was an exceptional case, it was a mace mitzvah, which a Kohen's allowed to, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just an interesting discussion. So let's look at this text right. about uh, the Midrash uh, referring to Eliyahu as Pinchas. Um, David, you want to read that? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, this is from the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. Yeah. Elijah escaped and fled to Mount Oreb, and as the verse states, and he got up and ate and drank. There, God revealed himself to Elijah. God asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I have been zealous, zealous for God. You have always been zealous. You were zealous in cheating to stand up to promise. As the verse states, 
son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest. That's all I have. Interesting. So, I'm sorry, I don't know why tonight my internet is being unstable, but any case. So there's the Midrash um, pointing over here that um, they, they, they're the same person. Um, now, exactly what that means, how they could be the same person, is also uh, debated amongst the sages and debatable. How could they be, you know, the two different time periods, um, whether it physically means the same person. I've heard in Hasidus in Kabbalah, it's explained that um, they have the same identical soul that manifested itself in different bodies, which uh, in Kabbalah, it speaks about that, Gilgulim, of uh, re um, souls that, um, that resurrect in different uh, forms of bodies, um, reincarnate, right? So th this is an important right. point that we'll bring up later in discussion, okay? But this is one of the points where, again, Elijah is brought up we, uh, um, well, in, in Jewish um teachings and, and things. where else is elijah brought up we'll continue along like we mentioned at the at the story of surrounding elijah's um death so to speak of departing from the world um the Torah itself doesn't say Eliyahu that uh, elijah died at that point it just says that he ascended on high so in Problem the, here. Huh? Sorry? You, no, no, okay, your internet got better, okay. Okay. The, so, uh, uh, the, the scriptures doesn't mention that he died, it just says that he ascended on high, and tradition is that Eliyahu actually comes to every Brit Mila, to every circumcision of a Jewish kid, of a Jewish boy every circumcision and in fact in halakha in shulchan aruch as we see in text number three um we set aside in the we set aside in the bris shulchan aruch writes the custom is to set aside a chair for eliyahu shenikra malach habris because eliyahu is called the angel of the brit milah and when the baby is placed upon that chair, we proclaim, this oh. is Kisei Eliyahu. This is the chair of Eliyahu. What's the background to that? Elijah visiting every, every circumcision is traces back to that moment when Eliyahu fled from the king Ahab. And when God appeared to him and asked him, what is he doing here? We read that Eliyahu bitterly complained to God about the Jewish people abandoning the Brit, abandoning the covenant that they had with God, which that's what made him to flee. So responding to that, Hashem informed him that he will be compelled to attend, to visit every Bris, every covenant. And in fact, it says, it says in the Zohar that God said to him, by your life in every place where my son marks in his flesh, flesh a bris milah, uh, you will be there. A, a bris milah, another word for bris, means a covenant. And the mouth that testified that Israel abandoned the bris, the covenant, it shall testify that Israel is upholding it. So that's the custom of Eliyahu being at every Brit and actually plays out in Halakha. Okay? Everyone with me? Yes. Yeah, so, if, if, sorry, I have a question. We say he, he went with his uh, physical body up in the heaven. Uh, good. You, um, we're going bring, we're gonna to get to that. Okay. Okay? Now, another important time when Eliyahu, and this is even more famous, appears in Jewish life, 
Jan, famously. Pesach Lai. Pesach. Pesach. the Seder, right? We know yeah. that on the Seder, we've, we have four cups of wine. And there's a custom that we pour a fifth cup at the Seder. And this fifth cup is called Kosh Shal Eliyahu, the cup of Elijah. Many have the custom at that point to go to the door when we pour, the, uh, uh, after pouring the cup and allow Elijah in. Um, uh, the, 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 the custom of allowing Elijah to come in. And after the Seder is uh, finished, the uh, tradition have it to many people have the custom to leave the doors open, unlocked, to allow Elijah and for what? To allow Elijah to come in. Let's see it in the text itself, in Halakha. Text number four. Lisa, you want to read it? Sure. There is a custom in certain communities not to lock the doors of the rooms in which they sleep on the Seder night, for it is the guardian night for all Israel for all time. It is a night for redemption from this exile. And when Elijah comes, he should go out, he should find an open door. We will, oh. Yeah, sorry. Is there rest? No, there's more. Lisa, we'll go out to greet him very soon. I'll continue. We believe this and there is great reward to this belief. Of course, in places where there are many thieves, we do not rely on miracles. The custom in these communities is to pour an extra cup and we call it Eliyahu's cup. So there are many customs. Why that fifth cup is called? So the ex we, that fifth cup is called Eliyahu's cup. So why is it called Eliyahu's cup? So he has a simple reason. The fifth cup is poured, but we know that we only drink four cups. So we pour the fifth cup, but we don't drink it. Why? Because why do we drink four cups of wine, uh, uh, wine on Pesach night? Is to commemorate the, in, in, in scripture, in Torah, there's four t expressions, there's four times that we read about God expresses um, him taking the Jewish people out of Egypt. So um, each one of those cups correspond to those four expressions of redemption. But if you look in scripture, there's actually five expressions in the Torah. And there's a debate amongst the Chachamim, amongst the sages, whether that fifth expression warrants a cup dedicated to that expression alone. Meaning if we should add a fifth cup to that fifth expression. Halakha, the, um, there's a debate and the Halakha is, um, the, is that it dismisses that opinion that, that says that it's worthy of its own cup, but we make a, what's called a half Russia. We make a compromise. To honor that opinion that it warrants its own cup, we at least have that cup on the table. We pour that cup of wine into the cup, but we don't drink it. So, in other words, it's not a fifth cup. We have only four cups, but rather it's just an additional cup to honor that tradition. What is that tradition? As we'll see, the tradition is that Eliyahu will eventually come and we know in the Talmud, in, whenever we have uh, matters of dispute and we can't come to an agreement and we can't come to an, a clear answer and clarification of what the law is, what the is, 
So I'm just going to mute everyone. Anyone wants to talk, you just unmute yourself. Okay. So we know that um, we know that um, uh, whenever you have a matter of, 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 of uncertainty in, in, in Jewish law, there's a debate. The answer we say, and we can't come to a conclusion, we just say teku, which means Elijah, when he comes to announce the coming of Mashiach, he will bring answers to all doubts, to all questions. So being that Elijah will clarify that debate amongst the sages, who was right, whether that fifth cup warranted to be a fifth cup of expression or not, that's how it gets dubbed Elijah's cup because Elijah will answer that for us. But, as, but in addition to that, that's why it's called Elijah's cup, and that's where the whole tradition of Elijah coming to the Seder comes from. But in addition to that, the custom of opening up Elijah's door on Seder night is very much connected to this idea of Eliyahu being the harbing uh, of the redemption, the announcer of the redemption, as the Maharal of Prague explains in this uh, reading. Um, Ruth, you want to unmute yourself and read it. Text number five. Sure. I suggest the following explanation for this custom. The Hallel and Nirta sections of the Seder are to arouse God's mercy and evoke our merit before God so that he redeem us with the final redemption. For this reason, we must let our children know and publicize our tradition from the prophets that prior to Mashiach's arrival, Elijah will come in and announce the redemption. Scripture makes it clear that prior to Mashiach's arrival to his holy chamber, Elijah will arrive. And thus, his arrival is the clear sign that Mashiach, who comes after, is the true redeemer. This is a fundamental piece in our messianic belief and anticipation that guards us from falling into the trap of a false messiah. Thus, the custom here is to open the door for Elijah the prophet and to pour a glass in his honor to a special cup of redemption. The intent of all is to publicize to our families and let them know that the final redemption is hinged upon Elijah coming to announce it. Indeed, his arrival is the litmus test to gauge the legitimacy of the righteous redeemer. Okay, so interestingly enough that within that tradition comes the connection between Eliyahu and the announcement of Mashiach. But on that point, we'll, we'll go into a little later. But that just brings out um, the idea of Eliyahu's coming out in um, Jewish life again with, with the Pesach Seder. There's another aspect that Eliyahu pops up in Jewish life. Um, in addition to those two listed above, the Brit Milah and the Pesach night. And that is, if you look in Jewish history, it's replete with this phenomenon of what's called Gil Giloi Eliyahu, the revelation of Eliyahu the revelation of Elijah, because it's considered a spe very special merit uh, for, 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 for very pious, dedicated Jews that they will have a revelation of Elijah the prophet, that they were privileged to see Elijah himself. And those stories of Eliyahu popping up and um, of, of this sort of a revelation is documented from the stories in the Talmud, um, uh, and the Talmud has a few different legend stories of, of visits from Eliyahu. In fact, the Talmud records a certain Rav Anan was visited by Eliyahu and taught him Torah, which he recorded in a book called Seder Eliyahu Rabbah and Seder Eliyahu Zutra. I mean, there's, if you go look at the Talmud itself in, in um, the Talmud uh, Ksuvahs in the Ketuvot, it says that um, he eventually, he got uh, really afraid 
of Elijah's revelation to him, uh, whereby he may, um, and he spent his um, time fasting and praying um, because um, uh, that, that he, but he was afraid of it after it happened a few times. And then he made a box for himself in which he sat and, um, and continued writing the teachings that were revealed to him. And that's why the two um, books that he wrote are Seder Eliyahu Rabbah, which means the teachings of Eliyahu Great, and Seder Eliyahu Zutta, which means small, because some people say that those were the two different say, stages where he got afraid. In any case, there are many other instances of Tanoim, Amaroim, meeting Eliyahu and the tradition even comes up later in, in later years in Hasidic tales and different tales many many stories and legends to that effect of Elijah revealing himself or coming in some shape or form um, to people. One of the questions that comes up and David brought this up in reading these accounts of Eliyahu revealing himself to people is was Eliyahu revealed himself as a real flesh and blood person did he come as himself or did he come as an angel or as a when we read about these revelations or as a vision so the Hassan Sofar explains that Eliyahu when we read about when he ascended on high he says that his body was left in the lower parts of the world of Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden, which, which the lower parts of Gan Eden, he says, are still considered part of this world, and his soul ascended higher. So those times where he is seen in flesh, it's really his body, and therefore he should be considered as a regular person in those times in which all halacha apply to a normal person. By contrast, there are times when he only appeared as a vision, and therefore in those times he writes that um, when he appears as a vision, it's not halakhically regulated. By contrast, there are other opinions that claim that it wasn't Eliyahu in body and flesh or even in an image, but an angel uh, because there's an angel called Eliyahu. And uh, those opinions hold that it's not necessarily the Eliyahu that we read in scripture. So that's just, uh, let's just summarize um, that who exactly is this mysterious um, and many believe that Eliyahu is the same, um, the same person as Pinchas, the grandson of Aaron. Eliyahu is a prominent figure in Jewish life. Tradition tells us that Eliyahu visits every bris. Another time he visits is on the Seder night, which is reflected in the custom of having a cup dedicated called Cup of Eliyahu at the Seder. And on that night, we hearken to the future redemption and, and anticipate Eliyahu announcing it. And finally, the Jewish tradition is, is replete with stories about revelations of Eliyahu, which are very rare and special people merit to see that, that revelation in their lifetime. And that is the Eliyahu who was. Now we're going to read, learn about the Eliyahu that will be. Okay? Anyone have any questions? Okay. Now, that we've gone in a basic background of exactly who Eliyahu was, let's get to the topic of tonight, what Eliyahu will be. That he'll famously come and inform the Jewish people of Mashiach's arrival. Where does that idea come from, as we ask? Believe it or not, it's right from scriptures itself. It's in the Tanakh, in text number six. It says in Malachi, in the prophets, 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Hashem, referring to Mashiach. So there it is in black and white. The Talmud takes this idea very seriously in discussing the prospect of Elijah's coming and announcing in a practical Jewish law. So now the Talmud takes that into consideration, obviously, because the Tanakh says it, and now is going to apply a Jewish law to that. So text number seven, the Talmud, um, Ruth, you want to read it? Sure. Come and hear that which was taught in a in a right. by Raita. Right. With regard to one who said, I will be a Nazarite on the day that the son of David comes. Okay, so for example, sorry, Ruth, sorry. So just a Nazarite is someone that um, that makes a vow that he will not drink wine. Oh, okay. So, um, or cut his hair. And the idea is that he will be solely dedicated towards Godliness, it's a, it, it, it be, today we don't do it. it, it it's a, there's a whole process of it. But the question is, is the Talmud asks, what about if someone makes an oath that he will not drink wine and he'll become a Nazarite because we don't become Nazarites today, but you can't, when Mashiach comes, there is the concept will once again, when the return of the temple, he says, he makes a vow today, there'll be a Nazarite on the day the son of David comes on the day, um, i.e. upon the arrival of Mashiach. So says the halacha, continue. Um, there, i.e. for example, upon the arrival of the Messiah, he is permitted to drink wine on Shabbat and festivals, for the Messiah will not arrive on one of those days. However. And then, oh, I'm sorry. However. He is prohibited to drink wine on all weekdays in case the Messiah has come and he has not yet been informed. The Talmud clarifies, granted, if you say that the prohibition of Shabbat limits applies above 10 hand breaths, that is why on Shabbat and festivals he is permitted to drink wine, for the Messiah will certainly not arrive from outside the Shabbat limit on those days. But if you say that the prohibition of Shabbat limits does not apply, above 10 hand breaths, why is he permitted to drink wine on Shabbat and festivals? The Talmud answers, it is different there as the verse stated. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. This verse teaches that Elijah will arrive the day before the coming of the Messiah. Since Elijah did not come the previous day, the Messiah will not come today, and therefore he may drink. The Talmud rejects this argument. If so, on weekdays too, he should be permitted to drink wine each and every day. Elijah did not arrive the previous day. The reason for the prohibition on weekdays must be that we say that Elijah may already have arrived at the great court, but it has not yet become a matter of public knowledge. Likewise, here too we should say that Elijah already arrived the previous day at the great court on the eve of Shabbat or festival. Okay, so one thing that is clear from that reading is that Elijah's role as, as being the announcer to the redemption is taken very serious, is a serious thing. So much so that if one makes a vow not to drink wine on the day of Mashiach's coming, a day of Mashiach's arrival, the Talmud considers it a possibility that should he be allowed to drink wine today because Mashiach can come any day. And if Mashiach comes today and he drank wine, then he, then he just um, uh, didn't go according to his vow. So the possibility of, it, of him coming today, the Talmud says, the fact that Eliel didn't come yesterday is enough of a proof that Mashiach can come today. You understand? So that's, yes. that's just from the halachic point of view. I'm not going to, there's more to discuss in that, but I'm not going to get into left. Does everyone understand and get me on that? I'm a little confused about the 10 hand breaths though. What, is, okay. what exactly so the, is that? The 10 hand breaths is talking about, because um, the idea is that the notion that Eliyahu cannot come on Shabbat 
like it says, would be because Eliyahu wouldn't be able to violate. You're not allowed to go out of the boundaries of a city on Shabbat. It's called Tchum. So um, there's a there's a halacha that Eliyahu that Eliyahu can't come on Shabbat. In okay. fact, um, that's one of the customs. In fact, to when we at the end of the conclusion of Shabbat that we mention Eliyahu Anavi, because and we pray for his arrival right as Shabbos comes out, because the tradition that he can come on Shabbat is because he can come from outside of the city, right. which is Ten Hambres. Um, and also he won't come on Friday because he doesn't want to, because the Jews will be preparing for Shabbat. And likewise, he will not come on Shabbos itself because he's got that issue of the boundaries. So as mm-hmm. soon as Shabbos is out, that's why we, we pray immediately for his arrival. Well, because then he's allowed to come. Thank you. Okay. Now, this idea, I'm just going to go a little bit of an tangent over here. Of, uh, I'm sure you, it, it all bothers you. Um, how could it, how could it be that Elijah is blocked, restricted, from coming at any time? We know, and we conditioned, especially if you're a Chabadnik. <laughs> To believe that Mashiach is coming immediately, anytime. You know, we condition our children and we, we scream out. We want Mashiach now. No conditions, right? And in fact, as we're going to be discussing later classes, part of the belief in the coming of Mashiach is Anima means that we believe in his arrival in any time, in any day. Meaning to say we believe that he can come anytime. If that's true, then how could it be that Elijah, who have, of course must arrive the day before, cannot come on a certain day of the week? Are we really suggesting that Mashiach cannot come on those days or, 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 or at certain times? So there are a few answers to that. And one approach is that a popular um, and it goes back to the, when the first class is that there are two possible ways in which Mashiach can come. And one is encapsulated in the terms bi'itoi, in its time. And one is achishena, before its time, sooner than its time. So very briefly, the Talmud teaches us that depending on the worthiness of the Jewish people, Mashiach can either arrive pre, um, predestined to arrival at its predestined time, or it can come sooner. On that notion, the Ture Evan suggests that this whole idea and this whole entire Talmud that li- limits Elijah's arrival to certain days of the week is only relevant to when his coming is beckoned sooner uh, because of the merits of the Jewish people. In such a scenario, when he's coming sooner than planned, then there can be some constraints on his arrival. However, if Mashiach were to come at his planned time, be it whatever that day is, you'll come, regardless if it's Shabbos or festivals. That's one approach. Another approach is more of a fundamental innovation of the entire idea of Eliyahu being the Harburger um, of the redemption is it's very possible that Elijah won't even come at all. There's many like drawing from that famous Talmudic um, idea of uh, that the Mashiach can come either in its time or or before its time, as we're going to see now, Rabbi Yonis and Eibschitz suggest that this whole idea of Elijah arrive, um, uh, announcing Mashiach's arrival is only talking about when Mashiach comes in its time, in its predestined time. But if 
we merit Mashiach coming sooner than expected, meaning Achishena, then one of the perks of that is that we don't need to wait for the announcement. We don't need to wait for Elijah's arrival. Rather, Mashiach can just pop in, waltz, waltz in, as text number eight says. Our sages post postulation that if they are worthy, I will hasten it. If not, in its time is well known. Now, Elijah's role to announce the redemption is certainly an integral part. I have a question. Sorry. Okay, let me just finish reading this text and then I'll get to your yeah. question. Um, now, Elijah's role to announce the, the, the redemption is certainly an integral part of the messianic process, but it is only necessary if the redemption happens in its time. However, if the Jews are worthy enough to hasten redemption, God will skip over mountains and jump over hills and change protocol. For the love Hashem displays to his worthy people will bend the rules. Of course, it's very much appropriate that El Eliyahu arrive and announce the redemption, but it's not necessary per se, for perhaps Hashem will have mercy on his people and bestow upon them a Holy Spirit to rouse them to serve him wholeheartedly then the redemption will be hastened so that Mashiach can arrive even without Eliyahu's announcement. All right, um, what's your question? Yeah, we saw before by the Maral of Prague, it's, it, it's intimate that the revelation of uh, Eliyahu and uh, Navi, the prophet, is at condition, is at night to make sure we're not going to have a false Mashiach. Yeah. So, well, I don't know if it's a tonight, it's also it helps. Oh, so it's not a condition. It's not a tonight. He didn't write it as a tonight. He just wrote that that, that also helps clarify against that uh, 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 false machine. I didn't see him write it, it that it's a condition. Well, I put it, it's a fundamental piece, okay, in our belief. Okay, fine. Because here, like you're saying, Bachishena, we don't need the revelation of it. So the meaning to say that whole program, so to speak, is uh, right. when it comes, everything's in its in its place, in its order. But if we merit for Mashiach to come sooner than it's time, right, it's right, to take away protocols. That's what Rabbi Yonis and I should to say. Right. Now. Another beautiful idea is, remember I mentioned, and many of the Hasidic Rebbeim mentioned this, this, including the Rebbe, um, and that is that, remember I mentioned that part of Eliyahu's tasks in uh, the coming of Mashiach will be that all the debates, all the arguments and the, the arguments between our sages that were left open that uh, we don't have clarification wh what the jewish law is but Allah, elijah will come and answer all those so therefore the sage the hasidic rebbeim and the rebbe says that this question how could mashiach come on shabbat or how can mashiach come erev yomtev if you have halachic uh, publications because of him coming with the tchum on Shabbos, or if he comes Arab Yom Tov, people are going to be busy with preparing and well uh, for Yom Tov, and then everything will get they won't be able to do Yom Tov properly, etc. So let him. So the 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 answer to that is Mashiach can come anytime, even on Shabbos and even Arab Yom Tov. Oh, what about the question? How how all those things are halachically uh, viable and think. Eliyahu will answer the, that question just like you'll answer all the others. Um, Eli, because that's his task of answering all doubts and questions. And there's a beautiful story of the Belzer Rebbe, a very holy tzaddik, that, you know, the Erev Pesach, the tradition is to bake matzahs on that day. And um, the way the Rebbe's would do it would that they would separate, you know, the whole idea of baking matzahs is that you keep the water and the flour separate until the point where it's when they meet and you make sure to bake it completely. So there's a beautiful minhag that the water comes from a very pure source. 
So you draw the water from the source that very day. So there's a minag with Rebbeim that they draw the water Erev Pesach, on the day before Pesach. So there's a story once by the Belzer Rebbe that when he was drawing the water, one of the Hasidim ants, uh, 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 said the idea to him, L'shana habab Yerushalayim, that next year you, 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 we should be in Jerusalem um, for Mashiach's arrive with Mashiach, that we'll draw the waters there. So the Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe said, why next year? We, uh, after all, we believe, uh, believe Mashiach can come any day. So Mashiach uh, uh, should come today. And we'll draw the waters in Yerushalayim today. So the Rebbe continued, and, and, and if you thinking, how can Mashiach come today? If there's a clear out Gemara that says that Mashiach can come on Shabbos, and festivals, and therefore Eliyahu wouldn't be able to come, right? The truth is, if you bothered that from that, if you bothered with that question, then let Eliyahu come, let Mashiach come, and Eliyahu will answer that too. We'll resolve that question just like you'll resolve all the other questions. And then indeed, the, the Rebbe mentioned many times in Fabrengans that Mashiach can come anytime, regardless what day. Okay. Everyone with me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So just to summarize, Eliyahu as the harbinger of, of, of the redemption is clear in, in Torah, is clear in the scriptures. The Gemara has a whole, de, um, um, takes that notion very seriously because it has a whole, a whole debate in its legal implications. And one of the themes that comes out of that legal implication is a discussion when Mashiach can come, whether he can come on Shabbos or on Yom Tov, or possibly not, if he can't come the day before, so not to trouble the Jewish people, and how can this be? Mashiach can really come any day, so we explain there's three possible answers to that, because one, it's a situation of um, Achishena, that is Eliyahu's arrival, can indeed be limited if it's coming before its time, but if it's coming in its time, then there's no limitations, he can come anytime. Or a second possible answer is the entire idea that Eliyahu must arrive before Mashiach is a protocol of Mashiach when Mashiach comes in its time. But if it's a situation of coming Achishena before its time, then you don't need that protocol, it's unnecessary. And then the third answer to that is Eliyahu can come at any time and the whole Talmudic issues of the implications to that that will be resolved with Eliyahu's coming, just like all the other um, doubts and issues that he will resolve to. Which brings us to full circle. Connecting Eliyahu with the future redemption. So, which is, um, now we're going to explain, we've explained, we went through a past history of Eliyahu, we went through Eliyahu of present, and we went through Eliyahu of the future. Let's now connect Eliyahu of the past to Eliyahu of the future, and, we, and bring it to full circle, and what implication does it have to us today to hasten Mashiach's arrival? Okay. So, everyone good with me? Yes. Yes. Bridging Eliyahu from the past with Eliyahu for the future. We've explored who Eliyahu was and who he will be. The question is, what's the connection between these two? And the fact is, if you look at the past persona of Eliyahu, it doesn't fit so well with this idea of him being the one who will herald the redemption. Because if you think about it, it's somewhat at odds. Because as mentioned earlier, Eliyahu of the past was one of a man that was a man of fire and brimstone. All we read about him is he's constantly admonishing the king and the Jewish people. Achav, his wife, Isabel, and in fact, Ezebel hated him so much for his admonishment that they put a price on his head to kill him. 
So he doesn't seem like the nicest guy <laughs> that you want around. By contrast, um, when we talk about Jewish imagination, especially if you, you, you talk to your kids and you tell them, to, you know, we always telling us kids stories about Elijah, right? And, and certainly in the idea of him being the one who will herald the redemption, Eliza's whole persona is one of goodness, of kindness, of such a, you know, he has that persona of being the, the nice guy. And after all, when we, when, as from kids, when we open the door for him on Pesach night, right? Who are you waiting to bring through the door? You're thinking of a great, beautiful, good angel, angelic type, not a guy that's full of warnings and brimstones. It doesn't fit so well. So how do we marry these two images of Eliel? And finally, as we do with everything in Torah, what does all this have to do with me today? Eliel seems like a good enough guy, but first of all, I can never be exactly like him. I can't I can, I can't even emulate to be like him. So what, how does that make my life any better? Um, and in truth, how did we bring Mashiach closer by learning about all this, about Eliel, which that's what we're going to address. So we'll address the questions by going back to that tradition that Eliyahu and Pinchas are the same person. So let's talk about Pinchas. So now I'm going to tell you that story about Pinchas. Pinchas, do you remember in, in the book of Bamidbar, there was an evil king, Balak, who wanted to destroy the Jewish people. And he tried many different avenues. And one of the avenues, eventually after hiring someone to curse them spiritually and things like that, he got was a clever man, he got, he got to, um, to attack them on the Jewish people's weaknesses. And what did he do? He went and planted uh, non-Jewish girls at them to, to make them sin and to get them in a spiritual low. Um, uh, 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 all young girls, which they weren't allowed to, and to, to destroy socially, marriages, etc., etc. And there was a pandemic, a spiritual pandemic, um, amongst the Jewish people at that time, to such an extent that it got so low that there were certain individuals, Zimri, that brazenly, openly took uh, one of these girls into his tent, openly and did an act of perversion, act of pro promiscuity in the Jewish people, in, 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 which meant that the, the Jewish people were in a threat of, of dissolving everything that they stood for. And at that moment, Pinchas, um, whose very name is synonymous with zealotry, um, looked at the situation and saw that the leadership was not answering and there was nothing to do. And he went against his nature, actually, the sages say, because he was known to be a peaceful, uh, very mellow person. And he went and zealously slayed Zimri in public in front of everyone to show that this is not, and things changed because of that act. So what was God's reaction to Pinchas's act? He was rewarded. And, and the, the reward, the Torah tells us, it was that the fact that he turned God's anger away from the children of Israel by zealously avenging God's honor was, and, and by saving the Jewish nation by, by not uh, that the, the Hashem shouldn't destroy the Jewish people be, because of that act. It says, as brisi shalom. The reward for that, the Torah tells us, that he was given 
Risi Shalom, the treaty or the covenant of peace. Now, something doesn't fit in that picture. The gift of peace doesn't, doesn't seem to fit the, the act. Because what was the act? The act was one of zealotry, right? Of killing someone. And he's rewarded with the reward of peace. How does that fit? So the explanation in, in that is by understanding better what we mean when we say shalom, when we, mean, when we say peace. Because in this context, what it really means by peace is, you know when there's not peace? When there's the great divide between Hashem, the Creator, and the world. And for when this prince, this Jewish prince, he was a leader, Zimri, he was a Jewish prince, committed such a defiant act before God. He created an, uh, a greater boundary between God and the Jewish people. He created what is the emphasis of, of peace. What does peace really mean? Is peace means complete, wholeness, harmony, which means that God, which means God and the world are at one, are at unit. And when Zimri created that, he created that barrier between um, this, this unity between godliness and the world, between God and the Jewish people. And it was through Pinchas's act of zealotry that restored that har harmonious, that unity between Hashem and the Jewish people, between Hashem and the broken people. So likewise, that was through Pinchas's act. And likewise, similarly to Eliyahu, which, who is tasked with the announcing of redemption, what's the whole idea of Mashiach? The whole idea of Mashiach is bringing peace to the world. What does that mean, bringing peace to the world? Is that the idea of the whole Mashiach's um, arrival and the whole Mashiach's task is to teach the world to have to be one with God, with the, 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 the godly presence will be tangible, will be evident, will no longer be hidden, that there will no longer be barriers, right? And that's going to usher in that ultimate peace. In other words, the reward that was granted to Pinchas is, Eli, is the same thing as Eliyahu. And that's beautifully uh, brought out in the Orach HaShulchan, Rabbi Baruch Epstein in this text, text number nine. According to the idea that Pinchas is the same person as Eliyahu, this Brisi Shalom, this blessing of peace is understood based on the Talmud, which states that Eliyahu will bring peace to the world. God blessed Pinchas with the privilege of restoring peace in the world in the future when Mashiach comes as the reward for the peace he restored between God and the Jewish people when he stopped the plague. In other words, this zealotry as peace is the story of Elijah, the prophet, as well when it talks about Elijah bringing brimstone on the nation. Yes, the optics of the story are scary. But what was Elijah trying to accomplish? What was, Elijah, what was Elijah doing that? What was the effort for? Was to bridge the gap that there should no longer be that the vision, that fra um, the, the fragmentation that existed with the Jewish people looking at other gods, etc. And to bring about the unity that existed the whole time between Hashem and its will. That what Eliyahu was trying to do with his brimstone, that's what Pinchas did with his zealotry, and that's what Eliyahu in the future redemption will do. In other words, this, these personas of Pinchas, Elijah the prophet, and Eliyahu the harbinger of the redemption are all the same. Pinchas who committed his zealotry 
brought about peace in the world, in Hashem's world. It was Elijah, the prophet, who continued that effort. And it will be Eliyahu again, once again, who will come and announce Mashiach's arrival that will bring it to the final um, uh, redemption where we will tangibly see that harmonious link between the world and Hashem, the peace. This notion of peace being the key to Eliyahu's arrival, and in other words, what's Eliyahu going to bring about? So far, when we talked about that, that Shalom, we talked about Shalom, and by the way, Shalom can also mean completeness, between Hashem and his world. There's a, a primal level to that Shalom to that peace. And that's between man and his fellow. Because that peace is also part of this puzzle, of this Pinchas Eliyahu circle. It's well known that the Beit HaMikdash, the, um, the Talmud tells us that the cause for the destruction, we always know that what's the, the cause to the illness, right? was because of sinas chinam, baseless hatred. And in other words, the remedy for that, which will bring about the, 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 the building of, the, of the, te- the third temple, will be about addressing that core issue. His remedy to that would be unbounding, senseless love. So when the Jewish people therefore are united, when we love each other, not conditionally, but unconditionally, right? That's when Mashiach will come. And Mashiach will come even sooner than it needs to come. And therefore, that peace between each other, that interpersonal peace, is what's going to affect Eliyahu's coming, which will bring the peace and redemption to the world. So Eliyahu is basically waiting at the wings. He's affected peace before and he's itching to do it again. That it's us who it depends on. Whether we're going to display that peace between each other. And by the way, when we display that peace between each other is generally is what's going to bring the peace to the world, right? Is because that's when we reveal the godliness in us and the godliness in others, because the only way to truly have complete love within us is that when we break down the ungodly parts of us, when we're only able to see the godliness in each other, that's when we are truly at peace within ourselves. So that means, that is the deeper notion when we say Pincha Zeliyahu, that meaning that Pincha is Eliyahu, that Pinchas, the man who achieved peace through his actions, that will bring, meaning that idea of achieving peace through action is what's going to bring Eliyahu, is what's going to bring the redemption and ultimately affect the ultimate peace in the world. As we're going to see now in the Rebbe's own words, uh, it's from a talk of the Rebbe in, in the Kutai Sikhas, Chaylek Beis, that was das is euch in dem Gedank von Pinchas is Eliyahu, that Yiddish. This is the significance of the idea that Pinchas is Eliyahu. Pinchas was a man of peace, namely peace and harmony between one Jew and another. This harmony is Eliyahu, is Elijah. Namely, it will bring Eliyahu, the one who will come and tell us that Mashiach is coming tomorrow and take us out of Galus exile. May it be very soon. In other words, my friends, it's up to us. Shkoyach. Um, next, lesson, next lesson, we're going to delve more into that idea of Elion. Shkoyach. Any, um, any questions or comments or? No, thank you. Mm-mm. No, thank you. I like what he said when stuck in the Masechet Eruvin, that
that uh, the Nazai cannot drink the, the wine on weekdays, then they put down, in case the Mashiach has come and he has not yet been informed. I like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> because he makes a promise. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Keep well. Okay. Have a good job. Thank you. You as well.